That's awesome, man. Dude, the parade was great, man. I, I tell you, it was awesome seeing uh, all the beautiful faces and kids getting excited every time uh, one of the floats came by. And uh, a couple of them had snow, which was awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that was super neat. <laughs> the alpacas, right? Uh, that was cool. They were awesome. They came walking by and everybody goes, I do not want them walking over by me. I, I said, why? She goes, they will spit on you. So I spit on her. I said, and so will I, but yet here you are. No, I kidding. But, but guys, but it was absolutely awesome. So we just thank everybody who uh, sewed into it, took time out for it. You guys are absolutely awesome to us. I am excited because it is freaking December. Right? December 4th, man, and y'all know me. I am crazy when it comes to Christmas time. So I am, for us, Christmas countdown was October 1st, but it's all good. But, uh, but for some of you uh, late folks, uh, I pray that your uh, Christmas time is, is coming in now. So trees are up, decorated, right? Your houses, I pray, are decorated. If not, man, you are really behind about two months. But... But I pray that indeed you're doing it, man. The Christmas shopping, the hustle and the bustle. We went this past uh, Friday, man. It was just so much fun. Then you get the baking and the cooking and the movies and the music and minus uh, uh, Hallmark. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, they're absolutely amazing. But, uh, but man, super excited. I know, again, for us, man, literally we were putting our tree up while we still had carved pumpkins on our uh, on our on our steps man as the kids were getting their halloween costumes we're putting up our christmas tree but it's awesome oh yes my sister will make it known that december is good for jesus and all but december is really my sister's birthday month you know she shares it with this guy named jesus you know what I mean? And y'all could acknowledge him if you wish, but mainly remember December 8th. Lord forbid if I don't say four days. <laughs> Countdown is on. But, uh, but absolutely awesome. And next few weeks, man, Amazon and UPS and FedEx and USPS. Minus USPS. But uh, everybody's going to be super, <laughs> super busy with, uh, with all these packages, man. And, and what's crazy that, I, that I've noticed, man, is some of these packages, and, and me and Randy actually talked about this in the back, some of these packages aren't even coming in in brown boxes. Right? So I said to Randy, I said, I'm going to throw one of the bus just real quick because I love Randy. But I said, uh, I said, man, our, my UPS guy is really cool because if we get a gift that he thinks is a Christmas gift, then he'll hit our ring camera and he'll go, hey, I'm going to put this on top of your van or I'm going to put this somewhere so that if the kids come home, they don't see it, right? Randy goes, I put it right on their front porch. <laughs> <laughs> Such the Grinch. <laughs> Such the Grinch. <laughs> yeah, right? He's like, yeah, they know what's coming. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but, uh, but, man, I read that last year, the Christmas season alone, there was 2.5 billion boxes sent out, which they said was enough to stretch to the North Pole and back. Right? So boxes upon boxes upon boxes upon boxes upon boxes. Absolutely insane. Right, hey, come on. Amen to it. Thank you, Jesus. But, uh, but I absolutely, but now boxes, but me and my sister, man, like real talk, we would always go around underneath the Christmas tree and we would sort out the boxes when, uh, when mom and dad were away to, to count to see who had the most boxes underneath the Christmas tree. And then we would move on from who had the most to who had the biggest, right? And then if mom and dad weren't around also, we would go through shaking the Christmas gifts, trying to guess what they were. And if we couldn't guess what they were, we would unwrap the Christmas present, find out what it was, and then we would wrap it back. So me and my sister are amazing at opening a present without ripping the, the uh, Scotch tape where it was. So if you need help, holla at your boy but, or your girl, right? Because we indeed got you. But man, in my house right now, there's boxes underneath the tree. Wifey has wrapped them all pretty and cute and tucked them underneath the Christmas tree, man, like a game of Tetris, 
right? Like, it's just absolutely awesome to me. Now, for every household in here, man, Christmas morning is going to be insane. Right now, the presents are pretty and tucked away, but here Christmas morning, man, wrapping paper is going to be flying everywhere. Boxes are going to be all over the place. Truth be told, man, making such a beautiful mess. Now, growing up, we would have wrapping paper everywhere, boxes everywhere, and it never failed. My mom would always start crying and say, I wish I could have got you guys more, right? Every single year. And I would always go, Mother dearest, what you got us was plenty. My sister would be like, I wish you could have got us more too, Mom. <laughs> but it's just, she's rude. But, um, <laughs> but indeed, man, like this, this, it creates such this, this chaos and this beautiful mess, right? Which is awesome, which is really a perfect picture of the first Christmas ever to be had and the beautiful mess that was with it. We're starting a new sermon series this, uh, this Christmas, man, called Unwrapping Christmas. Well, I want to talk about unwrapping or unboxing, however you want to say it, but unwrapping Christmas and, and what it truly, truly means, right? And we'll start today with the very first Christmas and how it started out of a different kind of unwrapping or a different kind of box. He tells us this in Luke. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn, her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So when we, when we see this passage of Scripture, man, we think that the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the great light, as Isaiah refers to him as, is born in the darkness of a cave-like stable, and he's placed in a manger. Now, if you think about a manger, man, a manger is really a, a long box full of food or empty, but it's for food for horses and for sheep and for cattle for them to eat out of, which makes sense because last week we broke down how he refers to us as sheep, right? So he is placed in this feeding trough for animals. And as we begin to picture this, I think back to myself and my beautiful bride when we had the honor to adopting our first son. Right? Mary and Joseph are getting ready to give birth to their firstborn son. They have absolutely nothing. We find out that we are able to adopt Elias literally like a handful of weeks before he's born. We had absolutely nothing. However, before our son came, we had all the toys. We had bukus of clothes. We had a diaper genie, right? Which is absolutely awesome. So we had a crib, anything and everything that you could think of, dream of, or imagine for a baby to be safe and or for your baby to be comfortable, we had. At that time, we didn't have any animals. But if we did, there's no doubt we wouldn't have let them in the room or in the crib, yada, 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 whatever it may have been. When they started to crawl, they didn't ha we didn't have any animals. And if we did, we would have made sure that they weren't going to crawl around in, in uh, uh, their animal bowls or whatever it may be. But then when you look at Mary and Joseph... When they give birth to their firstborn baby boy, they lay him down in an animal feeding bowl as his crib. Right? Like, like this is insane to me. And for years, Mary and Joseph only thought as a, of a manger as being a, a place that would be for food for animals to eat. It was a gift for the animals, right? There's their box, and they, and they get to go there every single day, and they get to eat the food that the humans put in there for them. But yet, this fateful night, it held the greatest gift ever to be given to mankind to eat from, and that is life himself. And it's crazy because you can only imagine as Mary and Joseph begins to, to, to walk around, right, as he may have been on a donkey, who knows, the whole thing story but the senses is happening right and they're trying to find a spot as as nighttime is approaching and they go knocking on the door at the end to see if indeed there is any room now what we have to understand is this isn't an inn like we think of as an inn this isn't some like commercial hotel right this isn't a, a, a holiday inn or this isn't the hilton right the greek word also translated for inn is guest room which I would believe would really give us a more correct image of what it is that we're truly looking at here. This is probably a private home 
filled with an individual's family who has room for guests. Right? So he begins to acknowledge that he has room for these guests. Now, they also have a stable attached. Oftentimes it would be underneath. But they have a stable attached. And, and this is going to be for the family animals. It's going to be for the guests' animals. Right? So we think to ourselves when Mary and Joseph show up, they knock on the door. They're told that there is no room for them inside the house or inside the inn. We think to ourselves, man, this is beat up. Because we oftentimes think to ourselves that, that Jesus is getting ready to basically come out of her birth canal as Joseph is knocking on the door and the guy sees Mary's water break and, and a baby's head popping out and he's like, ah, oh, sorry, there's no room for you at the end. We don't know all of that, right? Chances are Jesus wasn't about to come at that particular moment that they were knocking on the door, but who knows? But oftentimes that is indeed what we think. But we think to ourselves when we read that there was no root for them at the end. We think, man, that's beat up. And we think it's beat up because we know the story. Right? We think it's beat up because we acknowledge that that was Mary who was visited by Gabriel. Who told her that she was going to be impregnated by Holy Spirit overpowering her. And she was going to give birth to a son named Jesus who was going to be the savior of the world. And Joseph had a dream. And in the dream, Gabriel came to him and says, hey man, chill out bro. Take Mary. Everything is good. She's, she didn't cheat on you man. This is of Holy Spirit. Blah, 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 blah. So we know the story. But what's crazy is, even knowing the story, we see that this innkeeper or this man of this house had no room for them, but him not knowing the story and us knowing it, how often in our hustle and our bustle of Christmas, how often in the cooking and the eating and the gift listing, how often in the decorating and the Christmas celebrations, do we at the end of the day realize we've left no room for Jesus? That we've left no room for Jesus in our houses or in our homes. We've, we've left no room for him. And sadly, in the busyness that we find ourselves in every day, but especially around the holidays, it's absolutely easy to make no room for Jesus without even realizing you're making no room for Jesus. Right? Like, it's insane. We could get the prettiest tree and we could have the most decorated house in the block, right? We could have the most gifts that you could ever dream of, think of, or imagine tucked away underneath the Christmas tree. You could have all the proper Christmas foods that you could think of. You could have Christmas music blaring, whether it's Jesus Christmas music or just traditional Christmas music. You could have all of this stuff blaring, but yet if we make no room for Jesus, then truth be told, we simply miss Christmas. Yeah. Right? Even with everything going on, we miss Christmas. Look how many people the night that Jesus was born missed Christmas. Think about how many people this year will simply miss Christmas. And it's all due to having no room. And if you think about it, we celebrate Christmas the way we do because culture says to celebrate Christmas the way that we do. We celebrate Christmas when we do because culture tells us to celebrate Christmas when we do. Now, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. I love celebrating Christmas the way that culture also says to celebrate it. You might think I'm less than a Christian and that's okay. You're extremely holy and I, I apologize to you. But <clears throat> truth be told, <laughs> I, 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 I don't care how culture says to celebrate it. I love it. I have Christmas lights on my house and I, don't, I have a Santa on my house. I don't have a cross. Oh, gosh, I know. I know. Pray for me. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have one tree that is, is decorated all with Jesus ornaments, but the tree in my family room is decorated with funny ornaments. Right? So I don't mind that. I'm fine with, with Santa Claus. I'm fine with Elf on the Shelf. Hello. Some of y'all ain't, and that's okay. I'll pray for you. Praise the Lord. But, but it, is, it, is, it, is, it is okay to not to have your head so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. Yeah. Right? People aren't sinful because they have Santa Claus or because of Elf on the Shelf or because they hang stockings. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's crazy what Christians begin to get into. 
But I will tell you this. The first thing that my family celebrates is the true meaning of Christmas. That's the first thing we celebrate, right? And, and I want them to know what Christmas is truly about. So that's how we do things at the house. But so many of us are oblivious to the reality of the meaning of the true celebration of Christmas because so many in this world don't think of who was in the box, the manger, but they think of what's in the box underneath their Christmas tree. So again, to keep, we want to keep our faith wrapped up, especially Christians, especially this time of year. When truth be told, we need to begin to unwrap our faith. I get that Christmas has, uh, that culture has made Christmas into a fantasy. And I get that culture has made Christmas into a mess. But again, I'm fine with it. What I'm not fine with is we as Christians also not telling people the factual story of Christmas. I'm not mad at Macy's. I'm not mad at Walmart and Target and Toys R Us, if you could ever find them. I'm not mad at all these places that have all of this stuff out about Christmas. I'm not mad about TV, and I'm not mad about the cartoons, and, and again, Santa Claus and, and that stuff. I love it, and, I, and indeed, I celebrate that. But my children also know, most importantly, the birth of Jesus. They know that Christmas is about him and not about them. And they understand that because of him, they get gifts, as crazy as that is. Right? So I'm fine with that. Christmas is not about self-indulging, but Christmas is about giving away. Jesus was born to give. He wasn't born to get. So we teach our kids, praise the Lord, that since Jesus gave his life for us so that we could have life in him, we relate that to our kids giving other kids who have, no, who have nothing. We teach our kids the first we give to them. And then, praise the Lord, you guys get. Right? Like, and I love this. So I don't get upset. I took my kids to see Santa Claus. Praise the Lord. Took a picture with them talking to Santa Claus. I don't do Facebook and Instagram, but if I did, I'd post it and wouldn't care about comments. <laughs> right? Praise the Lord. Because I freaking love it. I love it all. I love the excitement of Christmas. And my Christmas doesn't just have to be the way that the church world, and most people don't, but the church world begins to deem the way that my Christmas is supposed to go. It's my Christmas, not y'all's Christmas. But indeed, it's my Christmas, and we celebrate, first and foremost, Jesus. But what's crazy, man, is if you talk to the majority of the people on the street, and you begin to ask them why they celebrate Christmases, in the, in the surveys that they took, you get a bunch of different answers. Many were, it's family time, it's a time to spoil kids, it's a time to celebrate with your loved ones. And, and I love this one, when they would ask in college towns, it was an excuse to party. <laughs> Right? <laughs> like, that's absolutely hilarious to me. But very seldom, from college towns to uh, the Bible Belt to anywhere else, very seldom did people actually in the surveys make mention of the miracle birth of God himself as a human baby. And I have to believe that one of the main reasons is, is because we don't want to unwrap that. We don't want to unbox that because if we truly begin to do that, then we feel as though in our, in our simple minds, we feel as though that now we can't celebrate the way that we are used to celebrating Christmas. But truth be told, man, I, I, I beg to differ. I believe that if we truly begin to unwrap or unbox the true meaning of Christmas, and we truly begin to grab a hold of what Christmas honestly is, then when we celebrate with the gifts and we celebrate with everything else the way that we're used to do, it's going to actually be a more meaningful celebration. Because now we're truly going to understand some of the things that we do that we actually really don't understand why we even do them. Right? But it's in knowing. And I don't know about you guys, but for me and my household, when we do our Christmas tree, man, it's an, a family event, right? Like we unwrap the decorations and it's just a family, it's kid friendly, it's fun to, to decorate the Christmas tree. Decorating the house, me and the kids have nothing to do with, <laughs> right? 
The inside of the house is wifey's. Now, the outside of the house is mine. Praise the Lord. I hang the Christmas lights on the outside of the house, right? Cindy blows me away every year. How Every year she decorates the house different. And every year I'm like, man, this is my favorite, right? It's absolutely awesome. And the next year she does that. That's like, my favorite. And I'm not lying. Like, it's on. I, I freaking love it. And every year I blow the neighborhood away with uh, how I've decorated the house. I'm like, man, this is my favorite, Frank. I'm like, thank you. And I know that. But, uh, but I just, I love it. Now, the thing about me and YV is we also love from the outside to, or from the inside to the outside, we desire it to be nice and neat. Now, my mind is twisted because I love gaudy, right? But I also want my gaudiness to be, to be nice and neat. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, it drives me crazy when I drive by and see some people's Christmas lights that have a section out. <laughs> Fix it fix it. You're, you're, stress, you're stressing me. You're stressing me. Praise the Lord. I can't. I can't. Because I'd rip your Christmas lights down. And I'd bless you with a box and tell you to start over. Jesus loves you. You know what I mean? Or, or like, or like how, like, like with me, man, the, the staple about every, on the outside of my house, about every two, two and a half feet. Bam. And then bam. Why? Because you got a tight line. Okay? Don't have droopy lines. Jesus. Jesus does not like droopy lines. It's <laughs> the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure he communicated that to me. But, uh, but seriously, man, tighten up your... Man, if it's... Guys, if it's swooping off of your house, now that's... That's not godly, but um, but indeed. So you want it to be you want it to be nice and neat, right? But but like like Christmas, we have turned Christmas. Truth be told, we have as much as we want it to be nice and neat, we've turned Christmas into a mess. And 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 we we've made it this this mess, not like the beautiful mess of the first Christmas, but we've we've turned it into this mess because we tried to cram. So much stuff into a short period of time. We've made Christmas into a mess because the amount of stress that we allow Christmas to bring us. The amount of anxiety that we allow Christmas to bring us, right? We begin to set these expectations for what our Christmas is going to be like when we know darn well we're not going to meet those expectations. We will make ourselves go bankrupt over Christmas and then we'll stress out about finances because we just don't understand what happened, right? Like it's, it's insane and we make no room for the worship part of Christmas. The most important part, truth be told, the only part of the real Christmas. And honestly, it's no wonder why people truly miss the true meaning of Christmas. And again, I'd go back to, it's not the stores' fault. It's not Santa Claus's fault. And it's not because people have elves on the shelves and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And it's not, it's not the, uh, 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 the cartoons' fault and all the uh, uh, cheesy Christmas movies. It's not their fault. It's, honestly, it's not society's fault. We love to put everything on society. But it's not society's fault for what Christmas has turned into. Whose fault it is is the Christ worshipers who have forgotten to bring Christmas back to what it is. Right? It's not Macy's fault. It's ours. Right? It's not this person's fault or that person's fault. It's our fault if we don't teach our family the meaning and the true reality of Christmas. And I promise you, you can still do that with all the fun cool, exciting things about Christmas and it's going to make it more fun, cool, and exciting. When my kids are little, they will tell you that Santa Claus works for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because they acknowledge that Jesus is the first and the foremost. Right? So thank you, Jesus. The very first Christmas was missed by everyone. Why? Because they were so busy doing their own thing. That they missed out on Jesus 
God Almighty who was right in front of their face. The people surrounding Mary and Joseph, truth be told, I broke it down for you with, with the Magi. There was not three wise men. To begin with, they never came to the nativity scene. They came to the child Jesus' house, so we have to understand that. But also, the wise men, the Magi, would not have traveled in a group of three. They would have traveled in hundreds. These cats freaking roll, yeah. right? Like when I go somewhere, it's like the Magi is coming. <laughs> I have a posse. Okay, <laughs> I don't. I have like me and my kids. Come on, guys. You know what I mean? We're like, this was so cool. You know what I mean? Everyone's looking at us. And it's like because Grayson's finger's halfway up his nose. And, you know what I mean? Elias' hair is going 107 different ways. And I'm like, good gosh almighty. And everybody's like falling behind. Dad, 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 dad. I'm like, yeah, me and my posse. Boy, as yes, we'll just roll. I'm like, y'all want us to leave? Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get out of here. But, <laughs> but like, like, it's crazy, right? Like, here's Mary and Joseph, who most likely did not just travel with Mary and Joseph for a handful of different reasons, but also because of the unsafety part of it. But anyways, the whole other sermon. So the people surrounding Mary and Joseph, whether we could say that they were with them or when they got to the uh, house that they were knocking on the door to see if they had a room, these people were so consumed with their own little world. They were so consumed with what they deemed to be important that everyone missed the creator of the world. And not to sound cliche on Christmas, but how many of us in our walk has played the innkeeper's role? Right? Scripture doesn't mention him by name. Scripture doesn't give any details about this cat, but we could also read between the lines. Here's this man. He's confronted by a man and his pregnant wife as the sun is going down and the moon is obviously coming out. So, so here he is confronted by this man and his pregnant wife, right? And he lets them know that there is no room for him. But to unwrap it, truth be told, he's generous enough that he tells them that they could go down to the stables and stay there with the animals. Now, it sounds screwed up. It sounds, you know, really beat up. But truth be told, at least he had the generosity not to say go somewhere else. He said, hey, you can stay here, just not in here. But yet, in doing so, he missed Christmas. Now, what's crazy to me is we begin to look at this and he was close. Gosh almighty, he was so close. And yet... So far away. So close. Yes, he kept them in the area. But truth be told, he missed Christmas. And the crazy thing about Christ is you can be so close to Christ and miss Christmas. How many of us in our walk, when we decorate our houses in our churchy, cleasy uh, 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 type of ways, or we decorate our house in our Christmas decor, right? We have this tight walk with Jesus. See, me and Jesus, we have this understanding. We are super close. But yet being pretty close or super close or extremely close or very close to Jesus doesn't mean crap. It means nothing if we're not worshiping Jesus and we see in the innkeeper's situation he was pretty close but yet still he missed Christmas and how many times in our walk do we get so consumed so caught up with our little worldly affairs with our fears with our worries with our stresses with our anxieties with our own little concerns <clears throat> that we miss out on Christmas who was right in front of us. How many times has Jesus knocked on your door and we answer only to tell him we have no room? How many times are we in the need of a healing, in the need of the miracle worker? How many times do we need a, the Savior and He comes knocking on our door to deliver us yet again the greatest Christmas gift ever to be given to us Himself to take vacancy in our life but yet we are so filled with other things in our life that we think that we need to be filled with that we end up telling the author and the finisher of our faith the giver of life 
we end up telling him the one that we desperately need the most that we have no room for him. Right? Like, it's crazy, but we also have to somewhat believe that when the innkeeper turned them away again, like I said earlier, perhaps he was unaware of her getting ready to give birth. Right? So, praise the Lord. Sends them down into the into the uh, uh, stable but what he also didn't do was send people out there for them there was nobody to check on them there was no midwives coming to see he had to at least acknowledge she was pregnant but yet because she's at the term where she's getting ready to give birth so she wasn't just walking around with like no belly she had a belly but yet he sends no midwives according to scripture because Scripture lets us know that she did this by herself. She gave birth. She wrapped him in cloth. She laid him in the manger. Why? Because Scripture told us there was no room for them in the inn. Mary did this. Now, yeah, Joseph was in there, but like many of you guys who were in your room, you were off to the side. <laughs> All right, here he is, yeah. Oh, my husband wants to be in here. Oh, yay. You know what I mean? Like, I can only imagine. You know what I mean? Well, I cut the umbilical cord. Okay, awesome. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's, it's, it's crazy. Here's Joseph most likely off to the side, and Mary's like, I got this. Stop. Right? And you didn't do this to me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I am, I am kind of off the hook, I guess, you know. So give his support up here, my darling. You know what I mean? Right? Like, like it's crazy. But as beautiful as this, this birthing session had to be, there yet still had to be a form of pityness of being alone. But yet what's so crazy to me is as alone as she was, the presence of him that had to surround her as she wraps her dirty hands around this beautiful baby boy you could only imagine God's hands being wrapped around her and as she lays him down in the manger man the presence of the angels that had to be around had to be so mind-blowing but yet physically no one's there for her it's insane. Her heart must have been so heavy, but yet at the same time so full of glory. The heaviness for the people who she knew was going to miss out on seeing the king born. But yet so full of glory because she had the opportunity to hold the baby God himself. The innkeeper, like so many of us, has missed the opportunity of having God. The mighty counselor. Oh, the wonderful counsel, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the great I Am, the Prince of Peace. Not just being in their household, but being in their home. The innkeeper, like so many of us, missed this. My prayer for us today, however, is that we will no longer miss this. The innkeeper was preoccupied. I pray that today we will no longer be preoccupied. He's preoccupied with his house. He's preoccupied with his guests. Bethlehem has a census, and, and, and so all these people are, are, are coming in to Bethlehem because of the census. So all these people are, are everywhere. My man's house is packed. He's changing sheets. He's doing this. He's doing that. He's, he can't wait for the people to leave. You know what I mean? Like He's got a lot on his plate. He's extremely busy. I don't think the innkeeper was insensitive. I don't think that the innkeeper was necessarily rude. He was just too busy. He was too busy to see God in front of him. Like millions of people this Christmas season, like millions of times with you, like millions of times with me, we have just been too busy. Not too insensitive, not, not too rude, not too sinful, just too busy to see God in front of us. But I pray that this Christmas season, we won't be preoccupied with the cooking. 
We won't be preoccupied with the decorating or preoccupied with the gift list making and the gift list buying. I pray that we won't be preoccupied with any of that to miss Christmas. The innkeeper missed his first one due to busyness. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you won't be consumed with busyness of finding the latest and the greatest, that we miss out on the greatest gift ever to be given to us, which is Christ himself. So as my worship team comes up here, this Christmas season, in Jesus' name, this Christmas season, I encourage you to think inside the box. Think inside the box by truly thinking about he who was in the box, the manger. Who was born in the, in the darkness of a stable to bring you the gift of the brightest light of life. Think more of that than you do thinking about what's in the box tucked under your Christmas tree that's lit up. So let's think in the box. Let's think of Jesus, how he was born, where he was born, and why he was born. Let's begin to truly unwrap, truly unbox our faith this season so we can truly have intimacy with Jesus our Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, we praise you. We love you. We give you honor and glory, my King. God, we pray that this Christmas season, my Lord Jesus, God, that it won't just be another. That we won't wait all year to be excited about Christmas. Then when Christmas gets here, can't wait for Christmas to be over. But God, that this Christmas would actually teach us <laughs> of the true intimacy with you. God, that when the Christmas tree comes down, when the lights get pulled off the house and put away, and the gifts are all put up and some even done playing with, and Santa's gone for another year, and the elves on the shelves are all boxed up, God, that we would have unwrapped our faith in you. That we would have unboxed who you truly are. To realize, my Lord, that you don't have to go in the attic. Back out in the tote in the shed. But God, that every single day, we get to rejoice in the gift that was unwrapped for us. Jesus. God, that every single day we would make the reality of who Santa truly was, the man of him, and begin to be givers because of you. God, that we would want no self-glory, but God, that we would want to give you all the glory. God, that when we saw a need like the man, that we would meet that need. God, that wherever we go, wherever we may find ourselves, my God, that we would make sure that people knew of the greatest gift that we have re ever that we have re that we have ever received. God, the greatest gift that you ever gave us, my Lord Jesus. And God, this gift is not just for us, but it's for mankind. Help us, Jesus, to get out of our pea brains that we dictate who you're for. That we dictate what type of people you came for. And that we would just get out of the way and show off the gift of Jesus and allow Jesus to do the saving. That we would allow Jesus to do the bringing. That we would allow Jesus 
to do the healing. We would show off the gift of Jesus. We would tell of the greatest Christmas gift of Jesus. And then, just like we let our light shine on our Christmas trees, just like we let our light shine on our houses, we would allow Holy Spirit to shine like only Holy Spirit can. So Lord, here we are. Use us. Help us. Encourage us to make sure, first and foremost, the greatest thing of our Christmas season is worshiping you and not missing you. Is anybody listening in the church or in the sound of my voice and Facebook? You don't know Jesus or maybe you do know him but you acknowledge that you've missed him. You've missed him and you desire to be with him and or you acknowledge that you've just simply missed out on him. Like you've acknowledged, wow, I haven't paid much attention to him. If that's you, simply open up your hearts right where you're at. Jesus, we thank you right now for having Holy Spirit to commune with these individuals. Some for the first time, some for the millionth time. But God, I thank you for Holy Spirit to commune with them right now like never before. As your word would say, to bring them in to the flock. God, I thank you, Jesus, for souls saved. Some for the first time. Some repenting of their sin and come, coming back again for the millionth time. But God, whether it's the first or the millionth, God, we celebrate today and rejoice in you. And we say, Merry Christmas and thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the gift that they are able, able to receive because you came down unwrapped for us. So Lord, we love you. We thank you and we praise you. And all God's baby said... So stand to your feet. We're going to get back in worship. You could drop your tithes and offerings there in the back. You can do it online. If you want prayer for anything, you can come up. We would love nothing more to pray with you. You want to sit where you're sitting? I promise you. It's not us that's going to answer your prayers anyway. Yeah. It's going to be through Jesus, through Holy Spirit. So you can sit where you're sitting. But we would love to link up with you, as Scripture says, and agree with you, okay? So we'll have some beautiful men and women up here who would love nothing more than to do that. But church, we love you. God bless you guys. Please remember that Jesus is madly and passionately in love with each and every Hallelujah. single one of you.